Here we go. Welcome back, music lovers. This is Matt and Cheryl's Gen Excellent Playlist. I'm Matt. I'm Cheryl. And we are winding down 1979. Going to add a couple more songs to the playlist. And uh, Cheryl's going to pick her favorite album of the year. I picked mine in our last episode, The Clash's London Calling. Cheryl's going to have a lot of input on this episode. We got, uh, Actually, our last two songs that we're choosing, Cheryl and I, today. And then Mike will join us on our final 1979 episode to offer his take on his favorite song and album of that year. And then we'll kind of recap the year and talk about songs that didn't quite make it for us, but that we love. The whole concept, we're talking about the music of our lives. We've reached 1979. We started Earliest Music Memories in 1972. And we're kind of building a soundtrack for a Gen Xer. Both Cheryl and I fall into that category. We're building this soundtrack of our lives, and we've reached 1979. We're adding more music with each year because... Obviously, the older you get, the more knowledgeable and a uh, bigger part music plays in your life, for most people at least. Uh, I know I started earlier than most people. but uh, Yeah, you practically started in the womb. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I see. Although yeah. I could say that for my children, they did start in the womb because <laughs> we were listening well, to know, music all the time. My parents... They just didn't, I don't ever remember my parents listening to music. Like, my mom had records, you know, but I never saw her listen to them or heard her listening to them. It was always, I went back and listened to them because that, those were the only records we had. And that's how I was, you know, discovering music. But she never sat down and listened to records or had music playing. Yeah, I mean, we had a record collection, but it's not like, I mean, I play, I play stuff, multiple things every day. I mean, it's constant. Yeah, it, it yeah. wasn't like it wasn't like that. I mean, it mm -mm. was, but it was the music was there, and it, it would get played occasionally. Anyhow, the format we've chosen is to have at least four big hit songs every year, two global hits, two of the biggest global hits of the year, worldwide hits, and then two big U.S. smash hits. So Cheryl and I will choose two hits each, and we've saved a hit for the end here. So our two songs today will both be number ones from that year. Actually, both hit the top of the charts within a few weeks of each other, uh, summer and early fall of 1979. And then Cheryl's album, definitely not going to be familiar to a lot of people who aren't into like alternative punk and new wave and stuff like that, but very influential record from 1979. So, Cheryl, I guess we'll we'll start with you since you got a little more load to carry this episode. Your song choice for your big hit, a song I definitely remember disliking when it was on the charts <laughs> back yeah. in 79 and early 1980. I've come around on it now. I definitely like it a lot now. Uh, and it was a one-hit wonder. The artist went by the name of M, and the song is Pop Music, M-U-Z-I-K. Yeah, we're going to be talking about pop music <laughs> talk about <laughs> cheryl why talk don't you about. talk about pop music pop 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 music before you start do you remember hearing the song when it was a hit i don't know if i actually remember the song when it was a hit i think it was probably after it was played on mtv and really i feel like a lot of that like the buggles let's say you know video killed the radio star a lot of these songs that came out in the late 70s and before mtv I didn't become familiar with them until they started playing the videos on MTV. So this is one of those songs. And I, I don't remember disliking it. I would think I was kind of neutral. It was catchy. It was it's one of those songs that gets stuck in your head. It's very sticky. So the artist is M, who is actually a guy, Robin Scott. And in the video, he's kind of like this DJ, you know, he's got the combed over hair and the, and the sunglasses and he's wearing like a suit with a skinny tie, you know, so, and he comes across kind of like that where it's not even like he's a musician. The lyrics are just kind of sort of spoken almost and not really sung almost to the point of like a novelty song, really. But it has endured. It is a song you still hear. It's a song that's played, you know, in like movies and I think probably commercials. It does have a very TV commercial kind of feel to it. So I, I'm sure it has been in a commercial at some point. So Robin Scott, actually, he went to art school with Malcolm McLaren, who people probably are familiar with his name. He's the one that founded the Sex Pistols and basically started at least on the fashion side, the punk movement in England. When when Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood started the sex store, which is where Johnny Rotten came in and where the sex pistols were born and so, you know, where a lot of that fashion came from, they actually invited Robin 
to be part of that, but he declined because he wanted to go the music route instead. He started out just as a kind of a folky artist. He he actually was sharing the bill with people like Ralph McTell, John Martin, David Bowie. He had an album that came out in the early 70s. Do you know who his backing band was on that album, Matt? Uh-uh. Mighty Baby. Oh, okay. Which is a band that you referenced in our last episode. And that album, it's not on Spotify, but I found it on YouTube. It's really interesting. You would never, ever equate this music to what he, he was doing he in the 80s. And he, really, it's pretty cool. It's very much, it's a very Dylan-esque acoustic, but also brings in kind of like the Highway 61 Dylan and has like sort of the piano, like Mott the Hoople style piano. It's interesting, especially knowing what he became later. So that's sort of how he started his music career. And then he was doing some producing. And in the early 70s, he made demos with the band Camel. Okay. He won a national search for a star contest, which is kind of like star search. And he, he won a contract with EMI, but he turned it down because they wouldn't let his band go along with him. He was in bands with Pete Thomas, the drummer for Elvis Costello and the Attractions. And then he went on to produce a couple other bands. And this album came out in 79, of course. Initially, the single was released. And then he went on to record like a full album. This isn't the first single, though. There was, a, there was another single that came out that did not do anything. And then kind of out of left field comes pop music. And if you notice... This isn't pop music. This is pop music. So we're talking about pop music with a Z. Pop music. <laughs> pop music. Yeah. Obviously, he went the direction of complete synth, very produced, and really very similar to what the Buggles video killed the radio star were doing at that time. In fact, I saw an interview with Trevor Horn and he was talking about how M. Robin Scott, that was what he was sort of considering his competition at the time. So the album is actually really cool. It's interesting. It's very similar to the song pop music. And there's one song on there. And I've always kind of wondered about this because the way he spells music, Muzak, remember when Muzak started, which was the company Seattle, that was basically- Seattle company. And it was M-U-Z-A-K. Yep. They- took songs and basically turned it into what we know as elevator music. Yep. Well, he actually was inspired by that. He had come into contact with somehow with the Muzak organization in the US. And he was like, there's all these white collar workers like conscientiously putting together music with the precision of chemists way before Brian Eno was doing this. This was like in the early 70s. And he was like, and these guys, you know, they're wearing like white lab coats and they're... <laughs> and so he was really, he was actually really inspired by that. And he does have, there's several songs on this album that have music with the Z in the title. So I, I can kind of see too where he does have that almost like a Thomas Dolby sound to it, like a scientist <laughs> would, would approach music. The song pop music, it's very catchy. It has the background, the pop, pop, pop music with the female singers, which harkens back to that 50s girl group sound. Doobie, doobie, um, doo-wop. Bop, bop, yeah. shoe bop. Bop, bop, shoe up. Yeah. Very 50s, early 60s. Yep. One of the singers was his wife. And the band that he had put together, most of that band actually went on to form Level 42, which they had a big hit in like 85 maybe with something about something you. about you yeah. yeah good song really good song pretty much one hit in the united states but they were much bigger in england and one of the trademarks really of that band was the bass the mark king and yeah. yeah it's kind of funny actually because this song is so completely opposite of what i chose for my album this year it's just a silly little ditty it doesn't have any no depth to it it's just <laughs> but it is kind of like a perfect 80s pop song yeah because it brings in all the elements you know when you think of the 80s you think of like that that with the the synth sound and it it sounded really modern it sounded really modern yes. in 1979 yeah which is why i think trevor horn was thinking that you know, this is kind of like where music was going because 
they, the Buggles were working in inventors in modern recording. You know, they were looking all toward the future. And that's what, what this song had to it. It definitely had that modern feel to it. But it still also brought in the 50s, 60s sound as well on top of it. It really kind of is like the perfect one hit wonder for the 80s. Yeah, yeah. left field hit. Yeah. He probably wasn't really expecting this either because he was kind of just a fringe artist. I mean, he did have other singles that did make the charts in the UK. He had a couple other singles from that album. One of them was Moonlight and Muzak, but that was it after that. You know, he put out a couple more albums, but nothing that made the charts or... So it's kind of like the Buggles where there's really no band. I mean, it's just him tinkering in the studio, essentially, and, you know, adding No, he had more of a band. Did they tour to promote? No, you're right. They are similar to the Buggles in that sense that they were not like a touring band. And and the band that he was using to record that album basically were session musicians. So, yeah, there is a similarity there for sure. And Rob Scott, I did go on to produce more people, but he had nothing of a career like Trevor Horn did. This is pretty much it. Like, this is the only thing anybody's going to know yeah. from this guy. I've um, certainly never heard anything else by M other than pop music. I listened to the other two albums that came out after this, and there's some interesting stuff on there. But I find his what he was doing before he was M, because he was still Robin Scott at that time, to be interesting because it's just such a diversion from what he became later. And, you know, I mean, I think he just kind of capitalized on what was popular of that time. And this kind of, like I said, like with the Buggles and songs that kind of came out in this year and this era that really went forward into MTV to become, you know, the MTV hits. Yeah. I, in fact, they're ahead if, of their the time, Buggles, you know. Yes. If the, if the Buggles hadn't tailor made that song, I mean, they did, obviously didn't know MTV didn't exist at that point when they wrote Video Killed the Radio Star. It was just a perfect song to kickstart MTV, and they chose to play that as their first video. If that had never been written, I got a strong feeling that pop music probably would have been the first video they played on MTV. Yeah, that would totally make sense to me, too. Yeah. So really, it's kind of funny how that became what three years later, you know, was now all of a sudden like this is the sound. And it was a number one hit in 1979, just like Video Killed the Radio mm-hmm. Star was. But it seems like there was a few years there where things were still kind of not quite going totally into that real synthesized vein and until MTV hit. So he's kind of a visionary. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah, know. Yeah, you know, <laughs> contemporarily as a kid, I just didn't like I didn't like it. It was just kind of a goofy throwaway novelty sounding thing. He's not really singing. He's more talking over the, yeah. the track and it just didn't didn't That's do anything everybody's talking about he didn't say everybody's <laughs> singing about pop music right. he said everybody's right. talking about it <laughs> and i think talking. it is it is a silly just kind of novelty hit and that's that's what people like about it you know i mean it's just it's just kind of a bouncy fun song yeah i do which i, I think is, it goes no, well on a playlist no i agree and it's it's got it's minimal sounding i mean it's fairly spare in its instrumentation Now, the song that I'm choosing for my big hit from 79, also a dance-oriented track from, I think, one of the great dance records ever made, and that was Michael Jackson's, believe it or not, this is his fifth solo album. Really, it feels like his first, uh, Off the Wall, from 1979. He was still a kid when the first came out. This is his first album as a mature artist, and you could say, well, he never really did mature, and that's that's a whole different discussion. But he's 21 years old in 1979. You know, the Jackson 5 had left Motown in the mid part of the decade and gone over to Epic Records, and they were still putting out albums and really good, really great songs post-Motown, songs like Blame It on the Boogie, and I had that. 45 as a kid. Love that. That nearly made the playlist for 78. Uh, Shake Your Body Down to the Ground. A little harder funk sound. Yeah. Uh, They had a huge hit with Dancing Machine a couple of years earlier. So the Jacksons are still having hits. I remember Michael Jackson has been making music since he was five years old. He wasn't five when they first hit the charts, but, you know, when they first started performing, he was very young. And they had a huge hit record out, you know, basically out of the box at Motown with I Want You Back, which was released in late 69. I would put this track right up there with I Want You Back for the best song Michael Jackson was ever involved with, and it's Don't Stop Till You Get Enough, which was the first single off Off the Wall. 
So, you know, Michael Jackson had been a star since a young child with his brothers. He'd had four solo records out on Motown, but this was, you know, kind of throwaway fluff, kind of novelties, covers, stuff like Rock and Robin. He had a number one hit with Ben, which was a ballad, kind of a syrupy ballad, a love song to a rat from some TV movie, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, most of the most of the music pretty inconsequential. And it's he's really following the same track as Stevie Wonder, who was a young artist when he started recording at Motown, you know, under the auspices of all these other adults who are pulling the strings and providing a lot of the direction. But once Stevie Wonder hit maturity, he worked a new deal. His agent got him a, a lot of power and artistic control, and he started putting out some of the greatest albums in pop music history in the early part of the 70s, like Music of My Mind, Talking Book, Fulfilling This First Finale, Inner Visions, uh, that whole string of amazing music. And Off the Wall really fits into that same vein. I mean, I, I put the quality of this up there with Stevie Wonder's work in the 70s, Marvin Gaye's stuff in the 70s. It is not minimal. This is an incredible track. Now, he, he's working with the producer, Quincy Jones. They met on the set of The Wiz, a uh, movie that Mike was in, which was uh, a remake of The Wizard of Oz with a black cast. Dorothy played by Diana Ross. Michael Jackson played the scarecrow in the movie. And Quincy Jones was the musical director of the movie. Uh, the most famous song that came out of that, Ease On Down the Road. It's kind of become a bit of a, a classic, a standard. Not a really well-received movie critically. I remember seeing it years and years ago. And it was enjoyable. It was entertaining. And Michael is good in it. I mean, he's a talented actor. And he has his solo song in there, too. I can't remember the name of the song. but So part of the Jackson's contract with Epic Records was that Michael Jackson got a solo deal, too. But it took him a while before he put that record out. And he kind of just, after the whiz, he felt, all right, it's time. I feel I want to do my own thing. Uh, he didn't want to have his brothers involved. He wanted basically to have artistic control and put out something new. And it was a lot different than uh, what people had heard from his earlier solo records, which, like I said, were pretty light and throwaway. This was very sophisticated, very funky, and it set the template for you know what made him this global superstar was the fact that he's bringing in all these different influences, black and white music. R&B, disco, funk, pop, rock and roll, jazz, everything, Broadway musicals, all kind of in this stew and came up with his unique sound. And they eventually called him the king. He didn't want to be a black artist. He wanted to appeal to all. And Quincy, it's just a masterful production. We referenced it several episodes ago when I picked Marvin Gaye's Got to Give It Up, which was... Was that the 77 that came out? 76, 77. And I said that this track is very, very influenced by Marvin Gaye. Just an incredibly funky groove. And again, again, the same thing that propels Got to Give It Up into the just groove heavens is the Latin percussion accent. So you got a lot of like cowbell and, cowbell. and, and, and yeah. other Latin percussion. And it's just a mm -hmm. very intricate percussion track. There's more than one nod to Got to Give It Up. At, at one point in a breakdown of the song, you can hear these voices, just like on Got to Give It Up, where they got that party atmosphere in the studio. There's yeah. a little segment of little segment of Don't Stop to Get Up where you can hear that too, like these different voices in the studio, like they're kind of giving it a live feel. Yeah, definitely a nod to that song. And I'd say this this track takes Got to Give It Up to another level. I mean, just with the complexity and of the production. It's like Got to Give It Up is kind of like the live version where this song is like taking all the things they could do in the studio, too, and bumping it up a notch. The whole mix of it, you know, obviously it's a killer dance floor track, but it's also great headphones listening because there's just so many different things going on in the mix of this song. You've got some great players on there. Lewis Johnson's the bassist from Brothers Johnson. Uh, the drummer is John Robinson, which is a name I wasn't really familiar with till we were researching this episode, but he's a well-regarded session drummer. It came out of the funk band Rufus out of Chicago, Chaka Khan and Rufus, and played on all kinds of hit records. It was on all three of the Michael Jackson, uh, Quincy Jones produced albums. So Off the Wall, Thriller, and then Bad. You got, uh, and I finally learned how to pronounce this guy's name. Very famous session keyboardist. And it's pronounced like it looks, Greg Fillingames. I've, I've always seen that name and wondered, is it 
Fillinganes, Fillinganes, Fillinganes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's Greg Fillinganes. These are all guys that, that would work on a lot of different tracks that Michael did with Quincy Jones. Uh, Michael Jackson, ultra gifted, ultra talented, but he's no prince. I mean, he's not a, he's not a big composer. He's not not a musician as such. He's not proficient on any instruments. Doesn't read or write music. But he's a obviously incredible vocalist, incredible dancer, and he he wasn't like some martinet, you know, that others were pulling the strings. I mean, he had, he was very involved at this point, at least with this record in the production and choices that were made. Even though he didn't write a lot of the songs, he did compose this one. This is his song. Mm-hmm. He came up with the the lyric and the melody to it. Uh, Rod Temperton is a songwriter who wrote a lot of his big hits, came out of the band Heat Wave that had hits of their own. Rock With You, which was the follow-up single, the biggest hit on this record, Rock With You. That was Rod Temperton lyric. But this one's Michael's. And it's just it's just a masterful. I mean, this is really on the short list of greatest dance tracks ever, in my opinion. It's yeah. so funky. And then this is where you get the modern Michael vocalist with all these little... Uh, idiosyncrasies the little grunts and asides the hiccups that, yeah the hiccups <laughs> yeah oh and the squeals the all that this is where that really kind of debuts with the first single on this this album i mean he'd shown parts of it before you probably hadn't seen a lot of it unless you saw the jacksons live in concert but and here he was still yeah. with the jackson five at this point too right, right? Yeah. like they were they, still recording mm-hmm. as the jackson five yeah. yeah in fact i think they were touring when this album started mm-hmm. blowing up um, and they're still putting out records. In fact, even after Michael became this massive solo star, he's still doing stuff with that. And they, they yeah, put they out had a, at least one more album, like Destiny, I think. Right, was, Heartbreak Hotel, really cool song that's totally forgotten now. I, I remember liking it a lot, but uh, this record was massive. In fact, it's the first solo album uh, or album by a solo artist that had four top 10 singles on the U.S. charts. This was the first off the wall. Of course... A few years later, when Thriller comes out, the sales would. This was a massive yeah, would hit blow record. It out of the water, and, yeah. and Thriller, Thriller would just set a new standard for all, and and I and I think that kind of became a, a bit of a millstone for Michael down the road. Now, obviously, it's it's hard for some to separate the art from the artist here because we all know Michael was, uh, to put it euphemistically, an eccentric human being. What level of eccentricity? And how many of the, the rumors are true, who knows? But I have no trouble separating art from artists. I mean, there's plenty of great art that's been made by bad people. It's just they're human beings with all their flaws. And it shouldn't affect your enjoyment of the music because this music is so ecstatically wonderful. And this is a, it's a great, great record. I mean, it's, it's, you, it, the record just, it starts, it's the lead track, Don't Stop Till You Get Enough. And... If I'm making a Mount Rushmore of funkiest tracks ever made, that's probably on it. I mean, it's just so irresistible. And then you go right from that to Rock With You, which was inescapable on the radio back then. Just a, a wonderful, smooth groove, beautifully sung, beautifully produced. Whole album's beautifully produced. And then the third track, maybe the funkiest one on the album, Working Day and Night. Very up-tempo, again, with a lot of Latin percussion driving it. But all the singles were great off this album. Rock With You, the second one, Off the Wall, the title track. Another great song on side two. And then you got She's Out of My Life, which is this soft, tender ballad. And and Michael's actually crying at the end of it. And I guess, you know, they slavishly produced this album, take after take after take, to get it perfect. And he would break down at the end of this song. He's a very sensitive guy. And yeah. Quincy decided to leave that on there. Um, that little catch in his voice. She's out of my life. It's a, and it's, song. it's a classic moment. But Don't Stop to Get Him Up is my favorite track on it. Probably my favorite Michael solo track. And as far as anything, probably Jackson, also one of the one of the best first songs on an album, too. Oh, God. Yeah. You want to talk about grabbing you right off the bat. But uh, killer, killer record all over the radio. I remember hearing it. There, there was a big fuss around the album because this is like Michael's coming out as a solo artist. I mean, he'd had, yeah, he'd had these other solo albums and a number one record with Ben, but he was a child. This is him as an adult, his coming out party. This is his Stevie wonder moment, his talking book 
So he got it got a lot of attention, a lot of publicity, and sold bucket loads. Uh, but again, that would just be a patch on what would happen down the line with Thriller. And this was still innocent Michael too. I mean, all the crazy peculiarities of his personality weren't really known at this time or hadn't really manifested themselves yet. He still looked like an African American male at this point. And he's he is you know? still really young too. Like you see yeah. the the album cover and he looks very young. Obviously we've been seeing him as a very young kid for so long that you know he's obviously more grown up than with the Jackson 5's early albums, but he does have that very young innocent look still about him on the cover. And actually his mom, who's devout Jehovah Witness, was very upset about this song because don't stop till you get enough, you know, like that has some connotations there that could be considered you know, sexual and, and I mean, he's making a leap here into a whole new territory yeah. of I'm a young man. I'm going out on my own. I'm forging my own path here. And this is where he's kind of starting that not necessarily his image, but definitely his vocal delivery, like you said, and, you know, things that would become trademarks for him later. It's actually, it's kind of amazing to think about this album and then Thriller, which was just a few years after this. The difference between the look of him on the album cover versus like on Thriller, where he seems so much more like a superstar. Yeah. Um, suffice to say, it's an incredible piece of music. And the, the choice of, of Quincy Jones' as producer was rather controversial uh, at the time. And there was a lot of resistance from the record label. They did not want Quincy. I mean, they had big hopes for this record. They didn't want Quincy Jones producing because Quincy Jones was this jazz guy. They didn't think that it would be a, a fit. But if you look at Quincy Jones' CV, he's produced all kinds of different. I mean, he produced Leslie Gore's hits in the 60s. It's my party. And so, so he he had done pop successfully. He had done jazz successfully. He'd had multiple Oscar nominations as a film score composer. He would released albums with his name that were kind of funky R&B jazz hybrids and had big success in the 70s with those. So it was it was really an inspired choice uh to bring him on and and Michael kind of fought to keep Quincy Jones as his producer and it, it certainly paid off for all concerned. Probably not the only Michael Jackson song though obviously Thriller we're going to be talking plenty about that when we get into 82 and 83. I did want to mention two so this album hits the charts, uh, I think it topped the charts in summer of 1979, and there's certainly a disco influence, although I wouldn't necessarily call this a disco song. I think of this as a funk song, but there's definitely a, a strong disco influence in there as well. Now, in the summer of 79, you had this notorious incident at uh, Comiskey Park in Chicago, Disco Demolition Night, and I just watched an interesting locally produced documentary about that. So the significance of this event, it just it seems to have grown over the years. It made headlines at the time, but now it's just seen as this milestone cultural event and a lot of negative views on that as well, some of which I think are pretty overblown. Basically, it was, it was a big promotion by a rock radio station in Chicago that it, I think the best way of putting it, it was way too successful. <laughs> so you had, the, yeah. you had this DJ in Chicago named Steve Dahl young guy. He's only 24 years old, but he's this rising star. And, you know, we've talked plenty about AOR radio. This is when AOR radio was riding high, late seventies. So this station, Chicago, the loop had a big audience. They plucked this guy doll from a Detroit station. Actually, he came to Chicago to work for a different radio station, a rock station that overnight, and this happens in the radio business, stations change formats. And then you're out of a job or you adapt. So his station went disco and he was not a fan. And pretty soon he ends up getting this, I can't remember the call letters at the other station, but they call themselves The Loop. And they were the dominant rock station in Chicago. They were Chicago's KISW, uh, mm -hmm. which was the big Seattle station, KGON, the big rock station down here in Portland. That was the equivalent in Chicago. So I think the whole disco demolition night developed, you know, he already didn't care for disco music. But then, you know, to lose his job because of disco, to see this radio station switching format, then it became a crusade for him. Now it's so, personal. Right. Yeah. So he starts developing his audience at the loop. Basically, he, he started 
developing this anti-disco army. It became this crusade. And they gave themselves a name, this bizarre name called the Insane Coho Lips. That was like the name of his uh, anti-disco army. And they had all these, you know, you like, you just send into the radio station, you get like a, a badge, or you're like a member of this group, basically, and get tied into this. So this is kind of growing over the months. And then the station manager, Mike Vec, who's the son of the legendary Bill Vec, who was the owner of the White Sox at this time. Bill Vec was notorious for having all these crazy promotional stunts. And the station manager, uh, his name was Schwartz. He came up with the idea because Steve Dahl is starting to gain traction with this whole anti-disco crusade. And his, his, one of the things Bill Vec did was he put fireworks in the scoreboard and they call it the exploding scoreboard. So whenever the White Sox did something good, which frankly wasn't very often, they were a horrible team and barely drawing any fans at this point. These fireworks would go out, these pinwheels and sparks would fly and explosions out of the scoreboard. So his idea was, yeah, you got the exploding scoreboard. Why don't we blow up, have people bring in disco records and we can blow them up? Because that was part of Steve Dahl's shtick on the air. He would like put a disco record on and then pull the tone arm across the record, making the scratching, you know, across the record and then have an exploding sound. He said it blowed up real good which I believe is a reference to these SCTV farm film celebrity blow-up characters played by Joe Flaherty and John Candy. I could be wrong. I could get that reverse. Maybe they came up with the characters based on Dahl because SCTV, Second City, Chicago's the second city. That's where the comedy club was. Although SC, the SCTV television show, these guys are based out of Toronto. But I'm pretty sure that Steve Dahl is referencing SCTV here and the the blow, you know, so he's pretending to blow up these records on the air, and they say, "Oh, that blowed up real good." So they come up with this promotional idea, and the idea is fans are going to bring their disco records to the ballpark, and it'll only cost you ninety-eight cents for a ticket if you bring in a record that they can blow up. And they just they had no clue how popular. They, I guess nobody quite had realized how much that Steve. Dahl had penetrated this market and what kind of following he had because you had just throngs of young people showing up on this summer night. Basically, it was a big party. They were there to get effed up and blow up disco records. And these are rock fans. So like contemporarily, they've been all these references to this disco demolite as this watershed moment and this very homophobic vibe. Yeah, there's some of that. But I think it, that part is overplayed. I think it's just people who love rock music didn't like disco at all. They just, it was just anathema to them. Just the style of music and the clothes and the whole thing of getting all dressed up and blow drying your perfect hair and shaking your booty. And I mean, it just wasn't what rock fans were about. And, you know, Steve Dahl has said, you know, it wasn't anything political. We just hated the music. You know, we like rock. We hated disco and it was just making fun of it all, basically. But things got way out of hand. They overpacked this stadium with a bunch of rowdy young folks. It was a doubleheader. And even before the first game's over, they're throwing crap onto the field. Records are flying out there like Frisbees. And then the idea was, between the games of the doubleheader, they're going to put all these disco records in a big box and then get some pyrotechnics in there and blow it up. Well, once they did that, and they put way more explosive. It was kind of like the old Smothers Brothers who appearance where they put yeah, way too, the unexpected, way too much. Yeah. huge boom. Over, yeah. Overdid it with the explosives that and these actually, records. That actually is what deafened Pete Townsend's left ear and, and started his yeah. tinnitus. Didn't his hair catch on his fire? His hair caught on too, fire. Yep. To, yeah. But so, yeah, you got these records flying high into the air. And then, you know, they drove Steve Dahl in there in a Jeep. He had a partner too on the radio, Gary Meyer. These are like longtime Chicago on air personalities. And they drove in, and he's dressed up in military regalia. He's wearing, like, a helmet. He's like George Patton leading this crusade. And he's screaming into the microphone and all this. And, and I think he's just completely blown away by, oh, my God. I knew I was gaining steam in this market, but look at this. Crazy. Uh, and, they're, and they're starting to feel a little intimidated by this rowdy crowd. They're all wasted and drunk and high and whatnot. And. And pretty soon, people start spilling out onto the feet. They're, they're between games of a doubleheader. I mean, baseball doesn't do doubleheaders very often anymore. Only, 
They used to do scheduled doubleheaders all the time. That's yeah, they only the do if they have to now. Yeah, now they only do it if there's like a rain on. They have to force, you know, have to get a game in. So things start to unravel. And then, you know, you know how crowds are. Once a few people start getting out there, then, the, you know, if other people feel less inhibited and they, they follow. And the next thing you know, there's the, the entire field is covered with people. And they're running around. They're vandalizing. They're like taking down the batting cages. They're climbing on the foul poles. Uh, people are breaking into this. I mean, it, they were oversold already. And you got hundreds, hundreds more people outside trying to get in. They're climbing up walls. They're forming human chains to get into the state. It's completely overrun by these wild people. Mayhem. The short story is they had to cancel the second game of the doubleheader. The White Sox had to forfeit because the field was so damaged. And this is seen as a watershed moment, a tipping point where disco, I mean, you think of 1979 is the kind of the last gasp of disco, but still in the summer of 79, it is dominating the charts, completely dominating yeah. the charts. And then again, uh, you know, this homophobic viewpoint of it, uh, where I feel it's overblown. It wasn't like disco was this niche music that appealed to gay people. It was massively popular and as mainstream as it got. I mean, the top 10 of the charts are completely dominant. You know, you had rock, you know, Rolling Stones are putting out disco records. Rod Stewart has yeah, one of the disco biggest was hits. permeating yeah. even like the biggest, even Kiss, you know, like the biggest right. rock acts out there. That fueled the backlash because these rock fans see some of their favorite rock artists like Rod Stewart and the Stones putting out disco records and they, and they see it as yeah. a threat to rock and roll. But well, people, were, think... people were just sick of disco dominating popular music and culture. And this was their expression of it. And it's seen as this tipping point where all of a sudden, you know, like it's almost like overnight disco is super uncool and bands like the Bee Gees are finished. I can see where it's coming from, too, because you've got these two very different cultures and you have one that the disco culture. Yeah, there's two. There are different facets of disco. Like you said, there's the hits like disco was huge, just mainstream popular music. Then you have the sort of like more underground part of disco, which is the clubs and yeah. which is more what is affiliated with like the gay culture. But some of that like the village people or like, you know, it's definitely crossing over into mainstream too. But what was happening at the disco demolition night, you have a huge, like you said, way more people than they expected. People are coming out of the woodwork showing a public display of something that they don't approve of. I'm sure that there's a lot of different reasons why these rock fans don't like disco. And I'm sure that part of the culture that it comes from and is part of it for some people. Yeah. Now I'm not I'm, saying that that's just like yeah. an overall I, I'm not, I'm feeling not of everybody that, that hates yeah. disco, but yeah, it's there's, step, there's definitely a see, racial component. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty threatening to see the music that you connect with, because that's either like who you are as a person, as a race, as a, you know, sexual orientation, whatever, something that really feels like it's music that speaks to you being destroyed by a mob of <laughs> Violet, people violently destroyed. violent yeah. mob of people that's pretty threatening and yes i agree it probably didn't start out as something that the intention was to put out you know this message against a, an entire group of people but it did end up coming across that way in the end yeah. and it, and we've talked about this before, too, how disco became like, you know, people wanted to get as far away from it as possible because it had fallen so far in favor. And it's unlike probably anything we've seen in music like that before. This has definitely played a part in that for sure. I guess a parallel would be if if, if somebody did something similar with hip hop. Yeah. OK, because I mean, it's it's the same with hip hop. There's there's a huge group of people that can't stand it. OK. Mm hmm. And it's probably lessened now, but at a certain point, it's crazy to me now when you listen to country hit radio and the, and the hip hop influence in country. I mean, at, a time, at one time, it would have been they would have been millions of miles apart. And people yeah, in like fact, country, I would put yeah. I would put country in a category too, where I'd say country and hip hop and disco are like three of the music genres that are very affiliated with groups of people. And yeah. 
now, like you said, to see country and, and hip hop kind of melding is just like mind blowing. But yeah, those three genres, I think, are ones that if it's like a personal attack on the people that connect with that music. Yeah. And I think if you, if you go back it, and uh, your average jock dude in 1979, probably be a, a rock fan or a country fan, but he might resort to going to the disco in order to get laid or meet a girl. It was seen as something l- less manly if you were into disco. It was like you're either yeah not a re- you're either not a real man or you're only doing that so you could try and meet some ch- meet a chick or you're doing well, it because and of I some think chick. too that would be the per- that, that would be the perception yeah and I think so much too with disco it's just it's not just the music but it's the connection with dancing you know like disco is what people were dancing to in the clubs and so when you bring in that kind of dancing part to it it feels more and the whole fashion feminine, you the know fashion like part of it too yeah yes yeah so the there's fashion, a lot that, that was a big I mean, part makes, of it. The, yeah yeah and so i i can see that there's a huge divide between the um like the fashion and the ideals maybe of the people that like rock versus disco yes the music started to kind of meld together like what is happening with country and hip-hop right now because i think it's just a natural progression that that's going to happen all music goes back to the roots which is in black music you know and r&b and then you've got funk and disco and it's not far-fetched that they're all going to end up meeting at some point anyway so it's not even really the music it's the culture it's the culture, the fashion, the uh, the political ideals, the you know, that's where you get the huge divide. And yeah, and I, I could see where minority groups would have felt threatened by that. But yeah, at this at this point in time, disco had become so pervasive; you know, it just had infiltrated so much of popular music that it was no longer gay, straight, white, black. I mean, it's just everything had this disco influence to it just about everything making the pop charts and now it's starting to uh infect you know rock and yeah. roll and yeah. it, it's perceived as this threat and that's kind of led to this backlash and um, we need to put a stop really, to it now and it happened yeah. like it was like a brick wall went up and anything disco was so uncool And we talked about this, too, how like that Village People movie came out in 1980, the one with Steve Gutenberg (laughs) and albums that, you know, 80, 81. Obsolete overnight. Yeah. Overnight. It had fallen out of favor so far that it was just like no one wanted to touch it with a 10 foot pole. The reason I wanted to bring this up now, and I think it makes sense to bring this up now, Michael Jackson, strong disco influence in this music. It's still very much there and it still would be on Thriller. A few years later, but Mm -hmm. he was immune to this backlash because he's bringing in all the, I mean, it's, it's a mixture. It's not just straight disco. It's just, it's, it's pop, it's rock, it's funk. Funk. I mean, it's all this mixed together, but with still with a, a very noticeable disco beat in a lot of this music and would continue to be there on Thriller, but nobody pigeonholed Michael Jackson Mm -mm. as a disco artist. And I think this whole, uh, I don't know when the King of pop thing started, but I think he and his management were pretty wise to latch onto that because he had, and to his credit, he was not a dumb guy. He was pretty savvy to his credit. He envisioned this world domination and this music that would appeal across all boundaries, racial, sexual age, and he accomplished that by yeah. bringing in all these different influences into this big melting pot. But, you know, you get to the heart of his music and Madonna and plenty mm-hmm. of other music in the 80s. Uh, long after disco was utterly passe and all the fashions associated with, it's still very much there in the music. Now, you've mentioned for a couple of years there in the early 80s, not so much. But once, you know, like the second British invasion rolls around, I mean, electronic dance music starts to become more of an influence it's still very much there it's just well not that's called, what i was saying was not called the, disco anymore right and that's why i'm saying that it's more it's not the music that ever really became passe or it's it was the culture yeah and the culture and the what's fashion. wrapped up yeah and the fashion so what's wrapped up in all of that but the music it's still the sounds of disco 
still continued to be part of popular music going into new wave, going into, you know, all the synth music that was happening in the 80s, going into like house music and all that. Like it certainly never went away. But it was just that all the other things that are attached to it that are part of the popular culture of the time that always kind there's always things in fashion and, you know, that become just like uncool. And that's the part of disco that really got. And that's where this Comiskey Park thing was. I think that's what it was targeting, too. And that's where people were feeling threatened because it was threatening their identity. Yeah. No, I can understand that. And uh, getting back to the, the Michael Jackson song before we finally get off this topic. You know, we've we've had plenty of disco songs already in the playlist. I've all, I loved disco as a kid. I've never stopped loving these great songs. Once we get to 79 and we already had. You know, Donna Summer's I Feel Love, very influential. Now it's getting to more synthesized, fewer musicians, more computers involved. But this, don't stop till you get enough, this still harkens back to the great disco songs of the middle part of the 70s where you've got all kinds of musicians. You've got A strings. Full band. You've got strings. Yeah. You've got horns. Horns. You've got multiple guitarists, multiple percussionists, keyboard parts. I mean, it's all in this huge mix. And that's that's the disco I have always loved and will always continue to love. Uh, and really, so like this... pop music is actually more like where disco was going right, with exactly. the synth yeah. sound and with the I mean, that could be if the if the vocals weren't so new wave sounding, it would feel more disco. That song would. All right. So there, there definitely was an element of culture wars to this disco demolition night it wasn't just about music fans there's that i don't want to discount that completely that's that is a part of it and at the same time in 1979 it's definitely turbulent times in london as well and you had a lot of anti-immigration sentiment going on in england at this time and in in london and uh and the the music world was starting to react to this and interestingly one particular rock band was incorporating a lot of elements of dance music and disco and funk into their sound also very much in the punk realm certainly uh the abrasive aspects of their music and the lyrics as well really incredible debut album came out this year and cheryl you've chosen this challenging album as your album of the year 1979 it's the debut album of gang of four called entertainment yes yes i have and actually i was thinking you know i had said to you at one point that i was going to pick the wall Pink Floyd, The Wall. And then <laughs> Very I decided, different records. <laughs> then I decided it's too depressing. Well, I wouldn't necessarily call Gang of Four Entertainment like a happy album. <laughs> it's very much but, an ironic title. Yes, exactly. Matt and I have referenced this before, the post-punk genre. And definitely this would fall under post-punk. Now, we also talked about how we didn't really think that that made a lot of sense and it didn't really mean anything, uh, just the name. It's not the greatest uh, sobriquet, I guess, for that style of music. But How I would describe this music is more angular. I would call it angular rock. It does have elements of punk, more in, I think, in the attitude, politics, and, you know, there's some abrasiveness there, but it's not in the same vein as, let's say, like the Sex Pistols or where you just have anger that is coming out, like repressed anger. I mean, there is, there's definitely anger there, but it's more directed toward something more concrete, like politics. Yeah. These are not working class guys like the Sex Pistols and, you know, members of the Clash other than Joe Strummer. They're educated middle yeah. class guys and mm-hmm. they're drawing on a lot of philosophical movements and a lot of uh, intellectual works. Right. Musically, I would say they're melding funk, dub, disco, definitely in the bass, very tom heavy drums, not a lot of not a lot of cymbal work, staccato, clean, biting vocals with spikes of like militant guitar that's precisely interspersed within the song. <laughs> Shards of guitar. Yeah. Yes, exactly. To me, they've got more of a rhythmic thrust coming from funk and, and disco, you know, in the bass and drums. But the standout instrument for Gang of Four is Andy Gill's guitar. I mean, it's mm-hmm. really original. It is. So John King on vocals, Andy Gill on guitars, Dave Allen on bass, Hugo Burnham on drums. They met at Leeds University. Uh, Andy Gill and John King were art students at Leeds, along with members of the Mekons and the Delta Five, two other bands that shared similar 
musical sensibility. This is Gang of Four's debut album. Damaged Goods was the first single from the album. They were signed on EMI. It's really interesting to me when I think about this. This song was popular. It, it charted, <laughs> you know? I can't go over the fact that this band was on EMI in England and Warner Brothers Records in the United States. Two major labels, which is yes. phenomenal to me. And I just find it so interesting. And this happens a lot, I think, in England, in the UK, where you have these bands that they're popular enough that they're in the charts. And when I look at them now, I think of they're a pretty fringe band. You wouldn't think that they would be in the mainstream, but they were. So they actually were scheduled to be on the top of the pops. But there's a line in At Home, He's a Tourist, where they reference rubbers. You should probably explain Top of the Pops for those who aren't Anglophiliacs. <laughs> okay, so it's the top 20, I think it's the top 20 albums of the week, yeah. right? Count, that it's a are... music countdown show, very popular, I mean, very heavily viewed in England. Yeah. Yeah, kind of like American everybody, Bandstand yeah. in yeah. our in America, except they'd have the bands come and mime their songs on the show. So it was never done live, except for a very infamous there were, there were a few, uh, New a few, Order. Yeah. It was very few. New Order was yeah. one of the first bands that came. They did Blue Monday live. and Really? Yes, they did. And the studio was not set up for live performances. The way that the, the studio was set up, it just didn't sound good. And they insisted that they do a live performance. And it's terrible performance. <laughs> But usually the bands would come on and, and mime their song. And One um, of the most famous performances on Top of the Pops was probably David Bowie the first time he was on there doing Starman, which, you know, the old cliche about Velvet Underground, you know, only a few people bought the record, but they all started bands. David Bowie's appearance on Top of the Pops doing Starman, but it's inspired countless young people to pursue musical dreams, P people who didn't identify with music of the day. And this was so different and appealed to misfits and, and, yeah. you know, non-binary folks. And yeah. So it was a big deal to be on the top of the pops. Like this yeah. is what all the You've made British it. artists were striving for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in the song, there's a line where they reference rubbers and they wanted them to change the line to rubbish and they refused. So they walked off the set. I guess I was surprised to learn that that was a slang term in England. I figured that was an American thing. Rubbers Yeah, that condoms. does seem like something yeah. that would translate, but apparently yeah. it did. And the single was banned on the BBC. So they ended up kind of losing support from EMI because of that. The first five songs on this album, some of the best music ever put on vinyl. Whoa. <laughs> okay. I didn't see that coming. I did not see that coming. So we're talking Ether, Natural's Not In It, Not A Great Man, Damaged Goods, Return the Gift. That's the first five songs on this album. That's side one. That's side one. Plus one more song. Continuing, you go into at least four other amazing songs on side two. Not only are these great songs, but the Gang of Four in this album defines a sound. They're a challenging band. Very much so, yeah musically and lyrically. And one of the things that when, you know, we're talking about the disco demolition, a big parallel here that what was happening in the UK at this time, like you said, uh, there was a lot of anti-immigration sentiment, including in the music community. Clapton infamously went on a drunken rant at a show in Birmingham in 77, spouting off racist rhetoric in support of the National Front and Enoch Powell. And you also had people like David Bowie expressing his fascist views and a lot of Nazi symbolism happening in the punk movement, like with Sid Vicious wearing you know swastikas and things like that. Susie Sue. So, Susie Sue Susie did as well. Sue. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, for a lot of these people, they were just trying to be shocking. Mm -hmm. It was it was somewhat of like an artistic statement in their, or, or fashion in their minds. Clapton had kicked heroin by this point, but he was a raging drunk. But David Bowie went back and actually did retract his statements and, and apologize. I don't think that ever really happened with Clapton. Um, David Bowie was coked out of his gills for years in the 70s. I mean, yes. absolutely out of his mind. Yeah, he probably doesn't even remember the, that this happened. But <laughs> so fast forward a few years to 79, the National Front coming in and really targeting the disaffected youth, which are the same people that are part of the punk movement. Right, so working class. Got, yeah. Mm -hmm, you've got the working class guys, you've got the skinheads, which not all skinheads are neo Nazis. I mean, skinheads, skinheads actually started out in the 60s and they were like, you know, the working class blue collar guys mm -hmm. and. 
it, 69, turn of the 70s, I think is when that really started to take off. Yeah, where it was more about social alienation and, and just, you know, being part of the working class society. And they were Doc Martens in the, the braces, which are we call suspenders. Yep. Ben um, Sherman shirts. Yep. Which is actually kind of part of what the mods and all, you know, they, they were they were intermingling with other groups of people that were into R&B music and, yeah. and reggae and, you know, had a lot of black music coming in. A lot, of, tri- music. A lot of tribalism in England and everybody had their own fashions. You know, the, you, you had a uniform that you wore. Yes. You were part of that group. Yeah. So this was making a resurgence in the 70s. Again, it came back, you know, like in the late 70s. And that's when the division between a lot of these groups where you had the skinheads, they weren't racist. They were actually anti-racist. They were supporters of, of black music and they were integrated within their music. They loved reggae and ska and yes. blue beat music. Yeah, that they were into yeah. black music. Yeah. But then you also had the National Front Party coming in and really hitting the streets and targeting, you know, the young people. So then you get the faction of the skinheads that fall under yeah. that. Uh, National so Front while, is basically a neo-Nazi party. Yes. Yeah. So while this was happening, Rock Against Racism was a grassroots organization that started in 76 in part as a reaction to those infamous remarks made by Clapton and Bowie. And they put on several concerts where Gang of Four played, and they were very closely tied to the organization. So really, this album, it has sort of a dual purpose. You've got the music, which was very, very influential. There's a lot of bands that you can trace back to their sound and that have like that angular guitar sound that came from them. But then you also had the political side, you know, what they stood for. They became something as an icon for people that were fighting against racism in England. This is also one of those albums too that, Matt, we've talked about this a few times about going when we were younger, reading the Rolling Stone record guide and trying to find albums that the record critics had said, you know, these are albums that you have to listen to. And these are- This was a five-star record. This was a five-star record. And we're talking about a time where we couldn't just go and listen to whatever we wanted to at any time like we can now where we have everything at our fingertips. We had to work hard to find (laughs) some of these albums that we'd only read about. And for me, this was one of those Holy Grail albums that Mm -hmm. I had, you know, I'd go to the record stores on the weekends up in Seattle. It would be one of many that was on my list that I'd always be searching for. And I never found it. Never found it. And actually... When I met Mike, my husband, he had a huge record collection. And the first thing that I went to look for to see if he had was Gang of Four Entertainment. And he did. <laughs> <laughs> when you say huge, you have to actually quantify that because it, that's a relative term. You're not joking around. He had a massive record collection. Oh, yeah. I mean, at the time, it was the biggest record collection I had ever seen. Maybe 5,000 albums, maybe more let's just say a wall of albums. (laughs) And I very distinctly remember the first time I heard this album and it was a revelation. It's funny to me to think about it now because, you know, we can listen to anything we want at any time, at any moment, (laughs) even if it's not on Spotify, even if it's not streaming, you can find it on YouTube. You know, there's, it's just, it's such a different mentality. And it was a really big experience for me to be able to hear this album for the first time. And you know After- what? When 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 you say that, I laugh ironically because I think to myself, what would John King and the late Andy Gill have to say about that? Because there is so much going on intellectually in their music. I mean, it goes yeah. way beyond, way beyond what you've talked about. What I get out of their music, and, and I'm going to say, you know, they're not one of my favorite bands, not even close, although I, I do appreciate them. I have the entertainment CD that I've never unwrapped. <laughs> brilliant album cover for entertainment the red yeah and then the picture of the cowboy and the indian shaking hands the indian has the red face Uh, very political cover right uh and i've got another one of their uh i think solid gold it Mm -hmm. was a twofer i think it was a twofer solid gold and and hard right was the other one yes the the one i've listened to is the compilation the uh brief history of the 20th century Mm mm-hmm So their music, you mentioned, it's challenging. It's not Mm -hmm. easy listening by any stretch Mm -hmm. of the imagination. It does have a great groove to it because it's drawing on funk and disco. So it's definitely got a groove. Andy Gill, the guitar player, purposefully avoided all 
guitar hero type moves. He wanted everything to be original, something that hadn't been heard before. So you don't get those typical guitar hero moves. It's a very original sound. It's angular, as you mentioned. It's choppy. It's uh, abrasive. He purposefully used cheap uh, transistorized amps rather than valve amps. So he didn't get that warm sound. They wanted it. He wanted it to be in your face and kind of cold. It's kind of rhythmically off. It's, it's, Mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't follow in. Yeah. But you know, as much as he didn't want to be a rock star, you listen to a track like Anthrax, that is an amazing guitar track. I mean, that is, that is, that to me is, is an incredible guitar performance. Use of Mm -hmm. feedback on that. And you didn't, and, and, you know, feedback, guitar feedback was something that came out of the 60s when the guitar heroes first started to emerge they, and harnessing that feedback. Jimi Hendrix is a big touchstone for these guys. They love Jimi Hendrix. And Andy Gill's use of feedback on Anthrax or Love Like Anthrax, whatever you want to call it, it's brilliant. I mean, it just really sucks you in right away. And it, and then the track itself, you've got two different vocal things going on. It's like a, yeah. it's like a, a call and response, but they're going on simultaneously. It's like one vocal is refuting the other or challenging mm-hmm. the other. It is so and cool. It's more like it, spoken word, you know, like yeah. talking over the, yeah. Right. Love will get you like a case of anthrax. And that's a and thing that's something I don't want to catch. catch. <laughs> that's a very anti-love song. And, yeah. and, and they, they tackle relationships and sex in a lot of their songs and mm-hmm. it's not romantic. It's not romantic at all. It's very heady stuff. And they really blew my head open when I really d- dug into this this compilation. And the liner no- almost, it's almost like the liner notes were more influential <laughs> than the music itself. Just cluing you in on what they're about, basically mm-hmm. what they're doing. And I was already heading in this direction as a young person, and 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 they just kind of pushed me over the edge. Is you question your motivations. What motivates you to make the decisions you make? I mean, I think at the heart of what they're saying, that it, that's really the foundation of it. And what they're saying is that as human beings, we've been programmed since we were born to think and act and do and say certain things. And basically, they reaffirmed that. And the key song for me is Natural's Not In It. That's the magnum opus, the big statement. Um, Mm -hmm. Making sure that the decisions you make, what motivates you to do the things you do, the things you say, the things you buy, the how you choose to entertain yourself, um, Mm -hmm. who you choose to be your mate, and how you express your love to this person. They're basically saying, what is motivating you? Is it natural? Or have you mm-hmm. been programmed? That's the heart of what they're about for me. And that's a big statement. And that's something that 98% of people don't think about. And a large percent of them won't think about because it's scary. <laughs> it's frankly yeah. easy. It's frankly easier to just kind of ride the wave and whatever is pushing you in the direction you're going rather than to question it. Uh, and they're right, basically because it gives you migraine when you question it. <laughs> it's this heaven gives me migraine. They're basically saying question everything, mm-hmm. question authority, question everything, question your motivations. I felt this way for a long time, but you know they get painted as this kind of communist band or Marxist band. I think that's pretty overblown. I mean, they're drawing yeah. on they're drawing on some beliefs. Mm-hmm. that fed into that but i don't think they would call themselves communists or marxists they're just intellectuals you know yeah. they're into philosophy this is intellectual yeah. music it is very yeah. the music is challenging the lyrics are challenging mm-hmm. And you get a lot of the almost like chanting you know where like they say the same thing over and over again and you can almost picture this happening like a speech I don't know if they're Marxist or communist. They're definitely anti-capitalist. And I think anybody who really gives it any thought will come to the realization that there is an expiration date on capitalism. It is not sustainable over the long haul. I don't know if if our generation is going to have to confront it. But if, if we don't, our kids certainly will with industrial automation and artificial intelligence. This whole concept of you work a job, you make money that allows you to afford a roof over your head and food to eat and whatnot. What's going to happen down the line when everything gets automated? You know, what are, what are the jobs going to be? How are we, how, how is this system going to work? You know, it's going to be totally different. 
Right. Have to so it's it's very challenging music. Um, the music I love tends to be more melodic based. So this isn't it's not going to be my favorite record of 1979. But I got to say this music, these people in the music world might have influenced me more than just about anybody else. But the mm-hmm. way I view the world and the way I live my life, um, it might not be my favorite music, but it has certainly been highly influential. I connect to this album a lot musically. I think that there's yeah. from oh, it's that groovy. period, it's, yeah. even from 79, you've got uh, like David Bowie Lodger actually has a lot of songs that are similar to in this vein. The pop group, which are nothing pop, their album, Why? Have you heard the first Adam and the Ants? Uh, so the Dirk of, Wears White side, only the tracks yeah. that are on the uh, Annex in the Forbidden Zone. I like them. Yeah. Very similar musically yeah. to this. The Slits Cut, uh, all girl band, dub, reggae influence. PIL, which is Johnny Lydon's band after Sex Pistols, Metal Box, very similar. Yeah, there's some debate this. about what, what's the first post punk record. I, I proffered up Magazine as being the, the first into the breach. Yeah. Yeah, television actually came out before any of those. Yeah. And actually, that's one of the interesting things about bands like Gang of Four. A lot of the punk bands and a lot of the bands that were like post-punk too, you can trace back to the 60s. You can trace back to, you know, like pop music of the 60s. That is not happening anywhere in this album. You're not hearing that. They actually became one of those bands that, well... Dave Allen, who's one of the original members, left in 81 to form Shriekback. He was kind of an outlier. He was not a middle-class egghead. He was just a work... He was a guy who answered an ad for a bassist, basically. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Sarah Lee, who had worked with Talking Heads and some other bands, she came in as uh, on bass. And then their sound really started to change. And they started to get a little bit more funky, a little more dance music-oriented, which was a big shift for them. So their second album, Solid Gold is very similar to entertainment. But then after that, that's when they started really changing their sound. Their next album, Songs of the Free, had I Love a Man in a Uniform, which is probably the only song that anybody in America is familiar with if they know any song from them at all. It was a college radio hit. More accessible. It sounds sounds nothing like entertainment or what they were originally. But it was also Um, very controversial. (laughs) mm -hmm, It was also banned by the BBC. (laughs) Yeah. During the Falklands War, right, it came yeah, out. Yeah. So then their drummer quit. Hugo Burnham left at that point. And their next album, Hard, they just used a drum machine. They didn't even have a live drummer on that album. So they went even further into the more into the dance music realm, which, I mean, I can understand because they were already heading in that direction. But they're like two completely different bands. Like you wouldn't even yeah. know they were the same band if you listened to, to Entertainment, Solid Gold and and hard. I mean, they just sound completely different. They did end up regrouping again in the 2000s and they were touring. We actually, Mike and I went and saw them. Um, they actually, they put out an album while you and I were working at Silver Platters. I don't know if you remember that, mm-hmm. Mall. Which also still was in the dance vein. But Entertainment is one that you will see on lists of best albums from the 70s. Critics list, you'll see this album pop yeah. up. Yeah, I think you know, it towers over the rest of their catalog, certainly. Yeah. And an- another fun thing to think about is if you could get in a time machine, go back in time and go see live shows, what would you choose? They toured the U.S. in 1979 opening for the Buzzcocks, which is one of my favorite bands of all time. I would love to have been able to go back in time and see one of those shows. Yeah. What would be your choice if you could go back in time and go see a gig? Don't say uh, the don't say the Beatles. Don't say the Beatles, please. <laughs> no, I wouldn't want to see them live. I, I think that would be you disappointing. Wouldn't be able to hear anything? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think you'd be very disappointed if you went back in time and, to see the Beatles. It would probably be the Who, like during the sellout era. Oh, okay. When you know you could see them in a smaller club and some of my favorite music. I mean, I would love to be able to go back to see CBGBs. Yeah, this just That's continues it. this continues our theme of uh very populist songs on the playlist and then uh more challenging, edgier album choices that we've had so far. Yeah, they are really different, aren't they? Mm-hmm. I I've gone back and looked at, at the playlist recently and I've noticed that we do have a lot of pop songs. We have a lot of, and, and actually it's interesting because a lot of the songs that we've chosen, not as the big hit of the year, but just the songs for ourselves, are big hits of the year and they were really mm-hmm. popular 
pop songs. <laughs> uh, we don't have a lot of rock on there. We don't have a lot of AOR. We have a few, but it's it's pretty minimal. We have quite yep. a bit of disco. And I think there's the reason for that, I think you and I both kind of made an editorial choice that we were going to lean in favor of songs that we would have liked as kids at the time uh, yes. over things that we've discovered later on in life. I think in I, the album realm, we've gone more toward the things that we discovered later. Or, right, because we wouldn't yeah. have listened to albums back then. We wouldn't have listened just, to albums. Yeah. We'd just hear radio songs and yeah, singles. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So as we proceed into the 80s, I think you're going to see more rock show up on our playlist. Start yeah, listening and to more also rock and we're music. getting to where we're, we're older and the songs that we are listening to, I don't know, well, maybe more for you. In the 80s, I mean, I'm big into Duran Duran and the new <laughs> wave and the new romantic era. And so I'm I'm not really into rock. Oh, I liked a lot of that. I liked a lot of that second British invasion stuff, too, in the 80s. So no, I don't know. Like I don't know if we're going to be able to, to satisfy those rock fans. We'll have to start being a little more mindful of that, maybe. <laughs> now, we'll get some 80s AOR going in there. For I know certain... Foreigner and Loverboy, and I was into that. Sammy Hagar. Working, working for the weekend. That's gonna, yeah. yeah. Working for the weekend is going to be on that playlist. I'm thinking Scorpions, Rocky Like a Hurricane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, quiet riots. Uh, come on, feel the noise. Yep. That's going to be a contender for that sure. Was huge. Yeah, we'll we'll get some rock. We'll get some rock. But when we get to the eighties, because that's when we started rocking. When yeah. We got to the 80s. <laughs> All right. So if, uh, come to the end of another episode of Matt and Cheryl's Gen X Lud playlist, adding two tracks to the list uh, this week. Pop music by M is uh, Cheryl's choice for one of her big hits of nineteen seventy nine, and my big hit choice. 1979 we're talking u.s hits here don't stop till you get enough by michael jackson and cheryl's album of the year is gang of four's debut entertainment so her album choice is that uh, to go along with my punk influenced album uh, london calling by the clash our next episode cheryl's husband mike of course they co-own silver platters chain of record stores the puget sound area mike's going to come in give us his album choice and his favorite song of 1979 and we're going to recap the year with all the songs and albums that didn't quite make it for us, but that we love and want to give their due. And uh, also, that's not quite going to be the end of 1979 for us. There's a particular artist that was more successful, uh, uh, a solo artist in the 1970s, that was the most successful, sold the most records of anybody. We haven't put any of his songs on our playlist yet. We got to do something about that. So we're going to give him his very own show and that is Elton John. So that's going to come up in a couple of weeks as well. But until then, uh, you've been listening to Matt and Cheryl's Gen Excellent Playlist. I'm Matt. I'm Cheryl. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Take care.